This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by Cornell University Press. Intellectual historians seek to better understand the past by studying the terms and concepts that we use to construct our social and political present. Concepts and terms such as liberty and equality. This is work that Cornell University Press supports. And one timely book that Cornell has published in this important genre of intellectual history is For Fear of an Elective King, George Washington and the Presidential Title Controversy of 1789. Written by Kathleen Bartoloni Twazen, For Fear of an Elective King provides a colorful and richly detailed account of the United States' first major congressional dispute, the formal title of the country's president. While today we take it for granted that the title is President of the United States, the first federal Congress actually battled over suggestions of what to call the nation's first president. They considered and debated titles such as His Elected Majesty, His Most Benign Highness, and even The Delight of Humankind. Bartoloni Twazen argues that, rather than being a frivolous political distraction from all the important business of government, the presidential title controversy actually embodied crucial debates about republicanism and citizens' hopes and fears about the new republic. And she also argues that the resolution of this controversy truly strengthened the Constitution. Selected as a 2015 Outstanding Academic Title by Choice Magazine, historians have praised for fear of an elective king as a delightfully well-written, outstanding work of historical writing, and a tremendously rich historical account that everyone interested in the early republic should read. Be sure to listen to episode 40 for more information about For Fear of an Elective King, and to explore the presidential title controversy of 1789. If you like what you hear, you should know that Cornell University Press is offering you an exclusive discount of 30% off the book's list price, just for simply being a Ben Franklin's World listener. You'll find the links for episode 40 and the sale in the show notes for this episode and in your Ben Franklin's World app. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 118 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. I'm just going to come out and say it. I love being a New Englander. I find its culture to be gritty and persevering. And I love complaining about the weather in that way that makes it seem like we have the worst weather in the world, but we're going to endure it like no other Americans because we always have. But I also know from living in and visiting other parts of the United States that the New English culture that I endure so much is also a bit imperialistic. And this imperialism in the Yankee culture is historic. It's something that we can trace back all the way to the first religious settlers who came to New England back in the 17th century. And historically, it's also a trait that many Americans around the United States really dislike about our region. Now, culture is something that I think about a lot, especially American culture because I am really fascinated with how Americans can be so different from each other as you travel across the United States and yet be so very similar to each other. And because I think about culture a lot, I've come to consciously recognize when the imperialistic parts of my new English culture come to rear their head. Two issues in particular have raised this sense of cultural superiority in my mind in the past, and those issues are slavery and race relations. And you know what? It's a false sense of superiority. It's irrational. I don't even know why I have it, but I just, I get it. So I've had to do some serious reflection. How did I come to this mindset that I can feel superior about slavery and race relations simply because I'm a New Englander? And I've determined after this reflection that it's really a mindset that I've developed over the years of my youth. I really hope this has changed. But when I attended grade school and high school in the late 80s through 2000, I never really learned about slavery. My teachers and textbooks always address slavery and race relations as Southern institutions and Southern problems. They were things that just didn't apply to New England. Why? Well, the South had plantations and used slaves instead of free labor. But here in New England, we had family-run farms and port towns, and we didn't really need slaves, so we hardly owned any slaves. And the slaves that we did own, we freed them right after the revolution. Because we're liberty-loving people, right? And slavery and liberty just don't go together. So we tried to do the right thing. And then came our lessons about the Civil War. Don't you know that those in the South held on to their slaves 
What were they thinking? I mean, our New English forebears freed the slaves because liberty and slavery could not coexist. But those in the South held on. So we Yankees had to push them towards war and then fight to win that war so that we could finally end slavery. Now, I've really generalized my early education here. But seriously, we skirted the slavery issue and we completely removed it from our New English history by learning about this institution as only a Southern institution. And in doing so, we've somehow raised generations of New Englanders to believe that the issue of slavery is not something that applies to our New English history. In fact, the first time I really learned about New England's long history of involvement with slavery, about its racism and intolerance, was when I attended college in Pennsylvania. Are you cringing yet? I'm cringing. I've been cringing for years. But the truth is, is that slavery was a national institution, just as civil rights and race relations are national problems in national history. These are aspects of our past that have greatly influenced our present. And all Americans need to grapple with this uncomfortable past so that we can better understand and navigate our present. So today, Christy Clark Pujara, an assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and author of Dark Work, The Business of Slavery in Rhode Island, is going to help us understand how the smallest state in the union became the largest American participant in the slave trade and one of the largest participants in the business of slavery. During our exploration, Christy reveals what the business of slavery is and how it differs from the institution of slavery, how Rhode Island became involved with slavery and the slave trade, and what life was like for free and enslaved African Americans in Rhode Island. Are you ready to venture into our national past by looking at the history of the ocean state? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is an assistant professor and Anna Julia Cooper Fellow in the Department of African American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research centers on the experiences of Black people in North America between the 17th and 19th centuries. In particular, she's interested in uncovering the stories of Black people in the small towns and cities of the North and Midwest regions. Today, she joins us to discuss details from her book, Dark Work, The Business of Slavery in Rhode Island. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Christy Clark Pujara. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us. Now, in Dark Work, Christy uses economic history to investigate how the business of slavery shaped the establishment and growth of slavery in the North and how the business of slavery affected the process of emancipation and Black freedom in Rhode Island. Christy, how do you define the business of slavery? And how is the business of slavery different from the institution of slavery? I define the business of slavery as the buying and selling of people, food, and goods that sustained plantations throughout the Americas. New Englanders, Rhode Islanders in particular, were the big box stores of the plantation societies in the West Indies and the American South. The institution of slavery refers to the laws and customs that govern slaveholding in a particular society, such as children inherit the status of the mother or the employment of non-slaveholders as overseers and slave patrolmen or the use of state or federal troops to come to the aid of slaveholders in the event of a slave rebellion. So the business of slavery provides auxiliary necessities, and the institution of slavery is about the laws and customs of a particular society in which slave holding is legally sanctioned. It really sounds like you can't have the institution of slavery without the business of slavery, that the two go hand in hand. That is absolutely an argument that I make. New Englanders were feeding the slave populations of the West Indies and then later the American South. And that is because in the West Indies in particular, all of the arable land is used for sugar production. So it becomes cheaper to import your food. They're importing their candles. They're importing the wood that is used to build a sugar mill. And so they are directly dependent on farmers, on coopers, on tradesmen in New England. Now, as you know, Rhode Islanders would become some of the biggest participants in the slave trade and some of the biggest practitioners of the business of slavery. But I wonder if before we talk about that aspect of Rhode Island's history, if Christy would tell us a bit about the early history of Rhode Island. Rhode Island was founded by religious outcasts. The first town, Providence, was established by Roger Williams in 1636. Two years later, Anne Hutchinson founded Portsmouth. 
That same year, religious divisions in Portsmouth led William Coddington to establish the town of Newport. Warwick, the last of the four original towns, was founded in 1643 by Samuel Gorton. Gorton had been banished from Portsmouth and encountered frosty reception in Providence and Newport. And so Rhode Island isn't founded as a cohesive colony. There are four towns in the area that becomes Rhode Island of these outcasts from Massachusetts. So Rhode Island had English sponsorship rather than a charter. There was no single dominant religion. In other words, unlike other northern colonies, Rhode Island was not founded to promote a particular religious vision, nor was it established for economic gain. All four founders had been expelled from Massachusetts as a result of their radical religious beliefs. The colony's four original towns were finally united under a charter by the British Crown in 1644, but they shared no central government and lacked a cohesive vision. During the first half of the 17th century, conditions verged on anarchy as the towns battled over land and boundaries because they were ultra-local and their concerns were ultra-local. They didn't see themselves as being in partnership with one another. Amidst this instability, there was one certainty, and that was water, the ocean. Water-based commerce in and around the city of Newport quickly became the basis of Rhode Island's trade economy. It was a likely enterprise for Rhode Islanders since water is what connected them all. By the mid-18th century, Rhode Island had become a permanent and prosperous colony as a result of local investments in the business of slavery. Colonists supplied sugar plantations in the West Indies with slaves and livestock and dairy products and fish and candles and lumber. In return, they received molasses, which they distilled into rum. This trade began in the late 17th century, but flourished after 1730, when rum became a major currency in the slave trade. So Rhode Island is unique. It wasn't founded with any kind of singular vision or any kind of singular economic plan. It was rather haphazard. So how did Rhode Islanders become involved with slavery? What came first, really? the institution of slavery in Rhode Island, or the Rhode Islanders' participation in the slave trade? The institution of slavery. The founding of Rhode Island coincided with the Pequot War, in which Native Americans were routinely enslaved. So there was the practice of slavery in Rhode Island before Rhode Island was Rhode Island. And Rhode Islanders don't get involved in the slave trade until the British lift the monopoly of the slave trade in 1696. Was that the monopoly that the Royal African Company held? Yes. You noted that Rhode Island practiced Native American slavery before it practiced African slavery. When did Rhode Island make the switch from Native American to African slavery? Well, Native American slavery was already present, and the transition to African slavery was rather haphazard as well. So in 1652, you have officials in Providence and Rhode Island that explicitly prohibit the enslavement of blacks and whites. They say that blacks and whites cannot be enslaved, which stands to reason that natives can be. 24 years later, in 1676, officials in Providence and Warwick again ban lifelong slavery for Native Americans and declare that they can only be slaves to repay debt. And so you would think that slavery is not going to exist in this place. But those were local ordinances, and they were not enforced throughout the colony, and sometimes even within Warwick and Providence. So by 1680, there were about 175 slaves in Rhode Island of both Native American and African descent. African slaves start coming into the colony via the provisions trade with the West Indies. So Rhode Islanders are encountering African slavery all the time as they trade with West Indians. It's commonplace. The first time you see Rhode Islanders buying African slaves directly from Africa is in 1696, when 14 enslaved Africans were purchased from the sea flower in Newport. So Rhode Island settlers are basically ignoring the dictates that came out of Providence and Warwick. And by the time we get to 1703, the Rhode Island General Assembly, which does speak for the colony, begins to legislate as if slavery is a given. So in 1703, we get a law about Native American African slaves not being allowed out after nine o'clock. So we don't have a law that says that Blacks and Native Americans are eligible for slavery, but we have a law that implicates they are slaves. And following that first law in 1703 that acknowledges African and Native slavery, you get a bevy of laws about slaves. And so it's taken for granted that Natives and Africans are slaves, which is not surprising when you think about business of slavery in Rhode Island in that they are the grocers 
to the West Indies where African slavery is the norm. But as Rhode Islanders get more involved in the slave trade, native slavery dwindles and African slavery explodes. Native slaves are seen as problematic in that they know the land well, they have connections with free native people around. And you start seeing political positions in which Rhode Islanders want Rhode Island free of natives, but they still want access to labor. And who do they turn to? African slaves, which they have access to via the provisions trade in West Indies and their entrance into the slave trade. What types of work did enslaved peoples do in Rhode Island and what were their day to day lives like? So there is some agricultural work going on in Rhode Island, but enslaved people in Rhode Island were just as likely to labor in cities as they were in rural areas. So enslaved Rhode Islanders labored in distilleries where rum was made, purchased slaves. They helped build the slave ships that transported enslaved Africans. They served as crew on those ships as they crisscrossed the Atlantic, and they grew the food that sustained the enslaved, particularly in the Narragansett region. Just as the growth of the plantation transformed Black life in the American South, laboring in the business of slavery transformed Black life in the North and in Rhode Island in particular. Prior to white Rhode Islanders' commitment to Atlantic commerce, the enslaved population was relatively small, scattered, and predominantly Native American. However, as the West Indian and Atlantic slave trade became the cornerstones of the local economy, more and more enslaved people of African descent were brought into the colony. Moreover, those larger webs of trading determined the places where enslaved people lived and dictated the work they performed. In coastal cities like Newport, Providence, Warwick, and Bristol, enslaved people worked as domestics, tradesmen, manufacturers, and shopkeepers, or they were assisting tradesmen, manufacturers, or shopkeepers. Most urban slave Enslaved worked alone or just with one other enslaved or indentured person. So they are living in the households of their masters, usually sleeping in doorways and garrets and in attics, having very little privacy, having to live out their lives under the close supervision of their enslavers. Most rural slaves lived on large farms with three or four other enslaved people of African or Native American descent or indentured white or indentured Native Americans. They labored as cow herders, shepherds, dairy farmers, and produced small amounts of grains, vegetables, cheese, and fish. There are also few slave quarters in the Narragansett, as in most whites didn't own enough slaves to warrant slave quarters. So again, you're living in very close proximity with your enslaver. And the few records we do have of enslaved people talk about how difficult this is, how hard it is not to have any privacy, any time away from those who keep you in bondage, not having any space that you can call your own because you're going to sleep in whatever corner is available to you. It's not like you would have a bedroom of your own. And also highlighting how different your life was from your enslaver, your clothes, your food, your ability to keep yourself clean and warm. So very stressful in that you're under constant supervision and not reaping any of the benefits of your own labor, the difficulties of families not being allowed to live together. This was especially true in urban areas where people wanted one or two slaves, not families. So children are routinely sold. Husbands and wives can't live together. So a very serious strain on enslaved people from an emotional point of view. Earlier, you mentioned that Rhode Islanders became involved in the slave trade once Great Britain repealed the Royal African Company's monopoly on that trade. Yes. Would you tell us how Rhode Islanders came to participate in the slave trade and how their business of slavery developed? So the slave trade was a natural outgrowth of the West Indian provision trade. So they know what West Indian planters want. They had already been providing them with foodstuffs and lumber and candles. They also know they want slaves. So it's a natural outgrowth of that West Indian provisions trade. The voyages grew increasingly common and profitable. So they began slave trading immediately after that monopoly is lifted. And within fewer than 30 years, they dominate the North American trade and slaves. And the slave trade evolves into one of the main pillars of the local economy. The vast majority of slave ships that disembarked from British North America left from ports in Rhode Island, even though it was the smallest and least populated colony. During the colonial period in total, Rhode Islanders sent some 514 slave ships to the coast of West Africa, while the rest of the colonists, North and South, sent just 189. 
As historian Jay Cotry has argued, the North American trade in slaves was essentially the Rhode Island slave trade. Rhode Island slave traders made their money by playing it safe. They sailed small ships that allowed them to avoid long waits for slaves and subsequent risk of disease on the African coast. In the first half of the 18th century, they sold 66% of their slaves to the West Indies, 31% in North America, and 3% in South America. And it's really amazing to think about when you think about how small Rhode Island is. It's 30 by 40 miles, yet between 60 and 80 percent of every slave ship that left British North America and then the United States of America came out of that teeny tiny place. The slave trade was their economy. Yeah, it really does sound like it was their economy. And I have to imagine that as a Rhode Islander, even if you're not directly involved with the slave trade by sailing or underwriting a vessel to Africa or the West Indies, You're likely working in a complementary industry like shipbuilding, rum distilling, or even growing produce for the trade. That's exactly right. It's all the subsidiary industries. So if you're a sailor, you are either sailing in the West Indians provisions trade, which is the business of slavery, or the slave trade, which is the business of slavery. If you're a carpenter and you're building barrels, well, you're building barrels for rum to buy slaves, or you're building barrels for produce to be shipped to the West Indies. If you unload and load ships, well, what are you unloading and loading? If you are a sale maker, if you are a shopkeeper, And then the duties that's paid on enslaved people that are brought into the colony are used for public works. So the streets of Newport are paved with the duties that are paid on slaves. So everyone who has a shop there, everybody who walks down that street is benefiting from the business of slavery. So the business of slavery figuratively and literally built Rhode Island. Now, how disruptive was the American Revolution to Rhode Island slave trade and their business of slavery, given that the British occupied Newport between 1776 and 1779? At the end of the American Revolution, Rhode Island was bankrupt because their two primary streams of finance, their economy had been obliterated by the American Revolution. In Jamaica, there's widespread famine because you can't get your food from the New England farmers. The slave trade, there's an embargo in Newport, and so slave ships can't sail, provisions can't sail. So the revolution served to bankrupt Rhode Island. And as soon as the revolution was over, they returned to what they knew best, which was the slave trade and the provisions trade. Did Dunmore's proclamation affect Rhode Island at all? Dunmore's proclamation being that famous proclamation from the royal governor of Virginia that freed slaves who reached British lines and fought for the British army. Well, I have to imagine that some enslaved Rhode Islanders may have been enticed by Lord Dunmore's proclamation because we have historical evidence of New Englanders who end up serving in Lord Dunmore's army. But most enslaved Rhode Islanders end up serving in the Rhode Island first. In 1778, the Rhode Island General Assembly offered freedom in exchange for service. So they were having trouble raising enough men locally to meet their quotas. And so against the pleas of slaveholders, they offer enslaved people within Rhode Island freedom in exchange for service. Over 200 enslaved Rhode Islanders volunteered. They served as foot soldiers and fought for nearly five years in Rhode Island, New Jersey, and New York. They were one of the few units that served for the duration of the war. At their first engagement, the Battle of Rhode Island, in August of 1778, the soldiers were commended for their tenacity and courage against an experienced Hessian regiment that was reinforced by British regulars. Do we have any idea why these men served in the first Rhode Island? Was it the promise of freedom? Was it a chance to escape all that white surveillance that left them with little privacy? I have to imagine that it was both. I haven't come across any direct evidence or testimony of enslaved men who served in the first, but I think their actions speak volumes. Within months of that act being passed, you get dozens and then hundreds of men who volunteer. And I think like most people, they wanted their freedom, they wanted their autonomy, and they probably saw this as their chance to not only free themselves, but free their families. How did Rhode Island's use of slaves and free blacks during the War for Independence compare with other states? Because if I recall correctly, George Washington was really hesitant to allow black soldiers into the Continental Army. He was, but they still served in state militias. And he's hesitant because he doesn't want a fight for freedom fought by slaves. The contradictions in that were just too glaring. But the soon-to-be states were facing the real problem of not having enough white men willing to fight. 
are able to fight. And so in New England in particular, you get the states turning to enslaved men to fight. Connecticut does the same thing. You have enslaved people fighting in Massachusetts. And so what Rhode Island was doing wasn't unique. What was unique is that the Rhode Island first was predominantly African-American. And so you get a regiment that's predominantly African-American coming out of Rhode Island. Now, after the revolution, Christie notes that Rhode Island came to embody two historical trajectories, one of black emancipation and another which was a bolstered commitment to the business of slavery. Christie, would you tell us about these trajectories? Because they seem to really be at odds with one another. Following the revolution and well into the 19th century, Rhode Islanders commit further to the business of slavery, and they also legally dismantle slavery. So throughout the first half of the 19th century, commodities traders, insurers, bankers, and manufacturers linked Southern slaveholding to Northern industry. Northern industry thrived because of slave labor, not as an alternative to it. Free labor in the North relied on slave labor in the South, and this is exemplified in the Negro cloth industry in Rhode Island. So the Narragansett transforms from really the dairy and bread basket into a manufacturing base. And this is where the Negro cloth mills are. Negro cloth is this cheap, coarse, blended cotton wool material that's manufactured especially to reduce the cost of clothing for slaves in the South. There were over 80 Negro cloth mills in Rhode Island. So that means that every river fall, Rhode Islanders are manufacturing Negro cloth. 79% of all of the textile mills in Rhode Island manufactured Negro cloth. So that means if we could get in a time machine and we go back to the antebellum South, enslaved people are wearing clothing that was made in Rhode Island. And Rhode Islanders are doubly dependent on slave labor in that they are buying cotton from Southern planters and then they are selling a finished product the Southern planters. And nobody else is wearing this Negro cloth. It was also called curtsy, but the colloquial term was Negro cloth. It was made especially to clothe enslaved people. It was strong, it was sturdy, and it was cheap. Now, again, Rhode Islanders aren't doing anything different than their neighbors. I mean, the famed Lowell Mills are too dependent on slave labor. That cotton doesn't come from the sky. It comes from the American South. And so as industry expands, in the North, the economies of the North and South are intertwined. I think this is often missed because of the way we tend to think of the Civil War as slavery being a Southern institution, but it was a national institution. And if we just take a minute and look at Northern industry and what happens in the post-revolutionary period, you see two economies that are interdependent on each other. So the rise of free wage labor in the North is dependent on the expansion of slave labor in the South. And Rhode Island highlights this. Now that we've had a peek at the business of slavery after the revolution, could we talk about black emancipation for a moment? How does the process of emancipation start in Rhode Island? Black military service has unintended consequences. And one of the first is that it eats away at the power of slaveholders. Because if you were an enslaved black man in Rhode Island who heard about fighting for Rhode Island in exchange for your freedom, you didn't have to get permission from your master. You just had to present yourself. And so it strips away at the power of masters. But even before that, like enslaved people throughout the colonies, when war breaks out, enslaved people take advantage of that chaos and begin to run away. So the practical breakdown of slavery in the North and the disruption of slavery in the South begins with enslaved people themselves. When they see a window of opportunity, they run. This is particularly true for the Brown family. Five slaves run away from the Brown family during the revolution and settle in Boston. So you have slave runaways. You also have slaves lobbying for their freedom. You have slaves that are fighting for their freedom, slaves that are bargaining for their freedom. We have records of enslaved people buying young children. There was an enslaved sailor by the name of Benjamin Freebody who was writing to his master, Samuel Freebody, trying to conjole him into freeing him. And so the practical breakdown of slavery begins with these kind of many modes of resistance of enslaved people, of running away, of lobbying, of fighting for their freedom, of bargaining for their freedom. And that is in conjunction with Rhode Island Quakers 
who have come to the conclusion that they cannot be good Christians and slaveholders at the same time. Quakers had been among the most prominent slaveholders in Rhode Island before the revolution, but revolutionary ideology is matching up with some of their spiritual teachings of spiritual equality. And they come to the conclusion that they cannot be both good Christians and slaveholders. And so you have Quakers who are pushing for legislation to end slavery at the same time that enslaved people are tearing away at the institution of slavery through their actions. And these two things coalesce to dismantle legal slavery in Rhode Island, but it happens piecemeal and it's slow. And by slow, I mean Rhode Island doesn't abolish the institution of slavery to 1842, but they pass a gradual emancipation law in 1784. And the gradual emancipation law says that children born to enslaved mothers after March 1st of 1784 will not be enslaved but indentured to their mother's masters. So they're kind of weaning themselves off slavery, establishing a expiration date on mastery. But what becomes clear when you look at the census is that most Black people in Rhode Island are free by the end of the first decade of the 19th century. And so that gradual emancipation really sets the stage. It becomes very clear to slaveholders that slaveholding as it existed before the revolution, inheritable, perpetual, is not going to exist, which allows enslaved people to push and bargain even more for the collapse of slavery. But slavery is legal in Rhode Island until 1842. So in these 58 years that it took Rhode Island to actually abolish slavery, did the state see any rise in the number of free black communities within the state? Or did newly emancipated slaves leave the state because it still had legalized slavery? Some are leaving Rhode Island. The black population in Newport is cut in half. So too is the white population. I mean, Providence really replaces Newport as the financial center following the revolution because of the blockade that was in Newport. And so the numbers of black people in Rhode Island stays rather steady. It doesn't really grow and it remains rather small in the thousands. And some of this has to do with the fact that you have so many families of mixed status. So you have some people who are free. You have some people who are slaves if you're born before 1784. If you're born after 1784, you were what historians have called a statutory slave or a slave for some time. And so you have families that have free people, statutory slaves and enslaved people. So moving away can become more difficult. But the population of blacks in the region remains steady. What was life like for the free blacks who stayed in Rhode Island? It was difficult. They were not surprisingly desperately, desperately poor because there are no freedom dues. If you ran away, you ran away with the clothes on your back. If you are free as a result of the gradual emancipation law, you receive no freedom dues. If you bought yourself, you used all of your funds to buy yourself. So this is a desperately poor population. And it's also a population that is socially and politically marginalized. They were free, but free was a terribly relative term. So people of color still had to contend with slavery on multiple levels. They had to cope with the legacies of slavery, most urgently the poverty that I was talking about. But being free also did not mean having rights. So free Blacks had ambiguous legal protections because they were not universally recognized as citizens. So they're existing in a nation where the vast majority of people of African descent are considered real estate. And so you have to operate within that system. Though the legal victories that led to emancipation were real, they were also accompanied by the reverse, legal losses that retracted these newfound gains. So interracial marriage is banned in 1787 in Rhode Island. African-American men are barred from voting in 1822. And so the formerly enslaved, the freed people, find themselves at the margins of society. And what were their everyday lives like? Because it really sounds like free African-Americans lack citizenship. So what economic opportunities, what educational opportunities, and what opportunities within their communities did free African-Americans have? So the vast majority of free women of color, they are laboring in the domestic trade. They're cleaning, they're washing, they're weaving, they're sewing, they're doing childcare, they're making paper and soap. These jobs changed little with the disintegration of slavery since the perception of what was appropriate work for women was unaffected by emancipation. What changed most for these women in freedom was living outside of the control of a master or mistress. They were no longer confined to the household. They had mobility. They no longer 
longer had to perform all the domestic labor in a household. Freedom allowed them to specialize and even refuse to do some menial tasks. Like I'm a laundress and that's all I do is laundry. I make soap and all I do is making soap versus under slavery where you would be responsible for all domestic tasks. Also, their ability to quit and find other employment radically changed domestic work. And it also drew bitter complaints from whites seeking domestic help. For the first time, Black women could prioritize their needs and the needs of their families over whites. And this was often interpreted as they were lazy because they would often prefer to work part-time, would want to do work in their own home before they did work in someone else's home. A few Black women also went into business for themselves. Mary Caesar, for example, sold cakes on the street, while other Black women peddled vegetables, fruit, candy, bread. Eleanor Eldridge, who has been written about pretty extensively, becomes a landlord. She begins as a whitewasher and a soap maker, saves money, gets some loans from some of her employers, buys a house, and then buys another. And she becomes the largest Black property holder in the state. But she was definitely the exception. Most Black women are laboring in the domestic trades, trying to bring some much needed income into their households. And many times they couldn't even set up their own household because it was expensive to do so. So many people move from slavery into servitude in one motion. Free men of color also performed many of the same tasks they had done as slaves. However, they were increasingly shut out of the skilled trade. Enslaved tradesmen enriched their white masters, while free black tradesmen were in competition with white men, who increasingly barred them from apprenticeships and trade organizations. So freedom was hard for black tradesmen who had been in demand as an enslaved person, but were perceived as a threat as free people. The majority of free men of color worked primarily as unskilled day laborers. They're porters, they're grooms, handymen, ditch diggers, servants, wagon team drivers, painters, cooks, stevedores. A few men of color found success as small businessmen in the service sector. There were very few black men in the professional classes in Rhode Island, and this has to do with population. In places like Boston and New York City and Philadelphia, there's a large enough black population that would allow for a small black professional class to service. In Rhode Island, it's too small. There's not a big enough black population that's going to allow for a professional class to have enough people to service. And finally, black men in Rhode Island found work as sailors. They're heavily overrepresented in the sailor class. Sometimes they would account for 25% of all seafaring jobs when they were just 5% of the population. How much of the work that free African-Americans performed contributed to Rhode Island's business of slavery? Well, they were definitely working in the business of slavery. If you're a stevedore and you're unloading and unloading ships, those ships are in service of the business of slavery. And really, what's your option? That's the work that's available. What they were shut out of was factory work. So you don't have blacks making clothing for slaves in the South. The factories were seen as white spaces. Without race being a consideration, they should have been there, meaning that factory operative work didn't take any kind of special skill. It was something that you could teach people rather quickly. There was always a need for more factory operatives, but whites did not want to work with blacks, not work alongside them. And so they're shut out of factory work. Do we know what free blacks thought about their experiences working in the business of slavery? Did you happen to come across any sources in your research that discuss their thoughts? I think for most of them, it was a fact of life, but I did come across a source in one of the mutual aid societies. They would not allow their members to work on slave ships, but that was, I think, just seen as too in the face, like, you know, being a sailor on a slave ship wasn't something that they wanted their members to participate in. Because the African-American community in Rhode Island was concerned about the plight of African-Americans in the South. They were abolitionists. They were hiding runaways. Would you tell us more about these mutual aid societies you just mentioned, and perhaps also about religious life among African-Americans in Rhode Island? I'll tell you about the first mutual aid society. The Free African Union Society was founded in November of 1780 in Newport, Rhode Island. It is the earliest known free Black association in the United States. The union members held their first meeting in the home of Abraham Casey, a prominent property holder and member of a small but influential black middle class. 
The union provided a variety of support services, such as paying for burials and providing widows and children of former members with financial aid. All the members were required to pay dues and demonstrate good moral character. The union founders were not content just to organize African Americans in Newport. They also reached out to Blacks in Providence. With chapters in Newport and Providence, the union became the public voice of Rhode Island's free Black community. Although the structure of the union was similar to contemporary white organizations, the functions and goals of the union were not. Unlike white organizations, there were no restrictions based on occupation, religion, or ethnicity. The common oppression faced by all Black Americans bound them together despite class differences. Nevertheless, most of the leaders in the union were middle class. They were entrepreneurs. They were businessmen. However, a couple of prominent members were seamen and day laborers were counted among the general membership. Enslaved men were not restricted from joining, although there's no evidence of enslaved members taking any leadership role. It's important to note that all these voices are male. Women were allowed to join. However, they did not have voting rights. And members were seeking to build a community that was morally upright, economically stable, and politically self-directed. Free Black Rhode Islanders were particularly concerned about access to education. One of the early mutual aid societies, the African Benevolent Society, was dedicated to the education of Blacks in the state. State law did not bar African American children from attending public schools. However, schools in Providence, Newport, and Bristol, where the majority of Black Rhode Islanders lived, were segregated through local ordinances. And Rhode Island did not establish a public school system until 1830. There had been other schools for free people of color. Abolitionists like Sarah Osborne and Samuel Hopkins had run small private schools for Blacks out of their homes. However, the African Benevolent Society was the first autonomous Black institution to focus exclusively on educating Black Rhode Islanders. Moreover, it was the first Black-funded school in the United States supervised and administered by Black Americans, and they offered a free education. They had a lot of trouble keeping teachers, and this was usually because of funds. You're dealing with a population that doesn't have a lot to give. And so financial issues plagued the African Benevolent Society almost from its inception. As far as religious life goes, religion is not a theme that I explore in any detail in the book. However, the African Union Meeting House, which was completed in 1821, was not only the first black church in Providence, it also housed an autonomous school. And in the 1840s, five all-black churches were established in Providence, Zion, Meeting Street Church, Pond Street Church, Christ Church, and the Second Free Will Church. There were also two black churches in Narragansett County, one in Wakefield, one in Morrisfield. And so the fact that there are seven black churches in a place that has you know, less than 5,000 blacks tells me that church going was an important and common experience. These churches also provide an important place for the leadership of Black men, as well as a place of worship and dignity for the larger Black community that had been previously segregated within white churches. William Brown's memoir speaks to this specifically, and I'll just read a quote from it. Many attended no church at all because they say they were opposed to going to churches and sitting in pigeonholes, as all the churches at the time had some obscure place for the colored people to sit in. This is prior to the opening of the African Union Meeting House that Black Rhode Islanders objected to being segregated within white churches. But when they had their own churches, you get a proliferation of churches being built. So it sounds like after the revolution, emancipated African-Americans set about forming and carving out their own communities. And it sounds like they lived a really hard life, but like they also found ways to make this life work. They literally build a community from the ground up. They make a way out of no way. They pull the little pennies they have. The few successful people in the community invest back in that community to build up organizations. And what I found just inspiring and admirable is how they refuse to give up. One mutual aid society would fold and they'd constitute another. And then that one would fold. And then a year later, they would try again and they would try again and they would try again in a school would fall apart and then they would start another school. Just this relentless tenacity of we'll get there. We're going to keep working at this. Sometimes we're going to invite in white allies if that's going to help us. But just relentless tenacity in their endeavor to build community, to build institutions. Let's talk about the Door Rebellion, because earlier you mentioned that Rhode Island finally abolished slavery in 1842. 
which happens to be the same year that the Door Rebellion ends. So would you tell us about the Door Rebellion and what role that event may have played in Rhode Island's decision to abolish slavery? The Door Rebellion were basically propertyless white men wanting the vote extended to them. So Rhode Island had a property qualification for voting. You had to have $134 in real estate and be a white man to vote after 1822. Before 1822, Black Rhode Islanders who did have qualifying property did vote, but they couldn't vote after 1822. And really why you get so many white propertyless men is a result of industrialization. So the rise of wage labor was a consequence of the emergence of the Negro cloth industry. So you have all of these white men who are working in the Negro cloth industry who are wage laborers who do not own land or don't own enough land to qualify to vote, and they want access to the vote. So the Door Rebellion is this constitutional crisis centered on the expansion of the vote of men who do not own property. At first, Black men align themselves with the progressive and advocate for universal male suffrage. But when the progressives fail in 1841 to achieve unrestricted male suffrage, Black Rhode Islanders switch sides and lend their military services to the state in the hopes of persuading lawmakers to remove race-based voting restrictions. So they have to make a calculated gamble. They initially back the progressives, but when the progressives don't back black suffrage, they switch sides to the state and say, well, maybe if we help the state put down this rebellion, the state will get rid of the racial qualifier for voting. So some 200 armed black men threw their support behind the state. They patrolled the streets and protected the armory. Their calculated gamble paid off. The 1842 Constitution extended the vote to all Native-born men, Black and white, and that state constitution abolished slavery. This is partly symbolic in that in the 1840 census, there were less than five slaves in the state. But I still understand it as a victory of Black political participation. Let's bring our conversation into the present day. At the end of Dark Work, Christie surveys memorials and public history sites The purport to commemorate the contributions of enslaved and free black people to the history and development of Rhode Island, and then acknowledges Rhode Island's participation in the slave trade. She ends the book by calling on Rhode Island to do more. Christy, would you tell us about some of the memorials and historic sites that you surveyed in your book and why you think they fall short in their interpretation and commemoration of the past? I can talk to you about the one at Brown. So the sculpture at Brown sits in front of the oldest building on campus, University Hall. It's a sculpture. It's a massive ductile iron chain rising up from a dome measuring eight feet around. The chain is broken at eye level. There's a stone pinlet with engraved text that reads, This memorial recognizes Brown's university's connection to the transatlantic slave trade and the work of Africans and African Americans, enslaved and free, who helped build our university, Rhode Island, and the nation. And it goes on to specifically talk about the role of the slave trade and Brown being a beneficiary of the slave trade. But in my opinion, it doesn't go far enough. Brown's connection to slavery is not just through the slave trade. The entire economy of colonial and antebellum Rhode Island was wrapped up in the business of slavery. The people who lived there, who had the money to donate, who had the land to donate, were intimately involved in the business of slavery, even those who called themselves abolitionists. Moses Brown had a textile mill. What's being milled there? Cotton. Where's that cotton coming from? The slave-owning South. It's slave-picked cotton, something that his brother, John Brown, pointed out to him when he was land-blasting slaveholding. So Brown, in my opinion, doesn't exist as an institution without the business of slavery. So it's not just about the slave trade. It's about the entire economy of Rhode Island. And I think that that's the problem with a lot of slavery memorials. Well, the first problem is there aren't really slavery memorials in the North and in Rhode Island. The one that I just described at Brown was the first of its kind at a place that owes its existence to black bondage. And that in itself is glaring. And in the past 30 or so years, scholars have made it, I think, increasingly difficult for Northerners to ignore the role that slavery played in the creation of the Northern colonies in their economic ascent focusing on slavery being a national institution, not a regional one. However, the responses to this new knowledge have been varied and complex. 
A few establishments and memorials have simply refused to tell the stories of Black Americans and have willfully downplayed the role of slavery in the economic ascent of Northern industry and capitalism. Nevertheless, most sites have put forth significant efforts to share the experiences of enslaved and free Black people and explain Northern investments in slavery, especially as Black history has become increasingly popular. However, these reinterpretations are often additive rather than fully incorporative. And because fewer and fewer funds are set aside for public history, the researchers and interpreters have had to walk a fine line between historical accuracy and offending private beneficiaries. In short, I think a lot of Northerners are embarrassed by Northern economic investment in slavery and have become comfortable with thinking of slavery as a Southern institution and would like to keep thinking of it that way rather than reevaluating slavery as a national institution. So in your opinion, an ideal commemoration of the role that enslaved and free African-Americans played in the development of the North and its various institutions would be to have historic sites and markers that were fully incorporative of that story into the North's history rather than just, say, having a separate marker or just kind of having something added to existing markers as like footnotes, if you will. Yes, that the economies of these places are dependent on slavery and that shapes social norms and that shapes political policies. Rhode Island commits to African slavery because of their economic ties to the business of slavery. Black people in the post-colonial period are socially and politically and economically marginalized because Rhode Islanders remain committed to Black bondage outside of their state boundaries. So the experiences of all people in that place are affected by it. And it's disingenuous for that not to be central to the story of the place. It's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, What might have happened if Rhode Island had found a different way to enrich her economy than by participating in the slave trade? How would the history and development of slavery in North America and the United States have been different? I have trouble answering this question. And I think some of this has to do with the research that I've been doing for the past decade. I don't see it making it as a colony. The first 50 years of its existence was anarchy. Were these towns fighting over land boundaries and who's in charge of whatever. And so things don't really come together until they turn to Atlantic commerce because Rhode Island really isn't even big enough for self-sustaining agriculture because you can really only grow things in the Narragansett. So I found it difficult to answer this question for that reason. And if you're going to do Atlantic commerce in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, you're going to be involved in the business of slavery. The rise of capitalism comes out of that. And they're part of this capitalistic enterprise in the form of colonies. So I found it difficult to answer that question. Now that you've investigated slavery and the business of slavery in Rhode Island, what are you researching and writing about now? My new research continues to evaluate how the practice of race-based slavery and its legacies shape the lived experience of Black people in North America. I'm especially interested in retrieving hidden and unexplored histories of African Americans in areas that historians have not sufficiently examined and have recently moved to thinking about the Midwest. This is especially relevant in the post-colonial period when white Northerners and Midwesterners claim that their given locales were bastions of freedom because there were few or no Black people. My current book project, From Slavery to Suffrage, Black on the Wisconsin Frontier, 1740 to 1866, will examine how the practice of race-based slavery, Black settlement, and debates over abolition and Black rights shaped white-Black race relations in the Midwest. And where should we look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have questions about Rhode Island history and the business of slavery? UW Madison faculty page and my email address, which is Clark Pujara at wisc.edu. That's Clark, C-L-A-R-K, Pujara, P-U-J-A-R-A at wisc, W-I-S-C dot E-D-U. Christy Clark Pujara. Thank you for taking us through the history of Rhode Island, the slave trade, and the business of slavery. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share my work. 60 to 80% of all North American slave ships sailed from Rhode Island. 
And yet many New Englanders don't think of slavery as part of their regional history. As Christie related, New England's history is deeply intertwined with slavery, both in its regional practice of the institution, which, as we heard, dates back to the 17th century practice of enslaving Native Americans, and in its support of the business of slavery. Not long after the War for Independence, New Englanders returned to making money from the slave trade and by supporting the business of slavery. In fact, even on the eve of the Civil War, as many New Englanders issued loud, vocal, and printed demands that the South abolish slavery, New England textile mills produced items such as slave or Negro cloth, and many more items made with cotton that Southern slaves grew, picked, and bailed. However, we shouldn't just focus our attention on the institution of slavery. We need to also explore the consequences of its abolition, too. Our conversation with Christie revealed that after abolishing slavery, white racism made it incredibly difficult for free African Americans to support themselves. They couldn't vote, they couldn't work in factories, and they had a really hard time finding work. And yet, they persevered. Rhode Island and Northern African Americans made a way out of no way. They fought for American independence, they formed communities, started schools, and worked to obtain the right to vote. They showed grit and perseverance in making a way out of no way, which, when you look at it, seems to be a very American and very New England story. Visit the show notes page for more information about Christy, her book Dark Work, and notes for everything we talked about today, benfranklinsworld.com slash 118. As the United States begins a new presidential administration, now is a great time to check out episode 40 in the presidential title controversy of 1789. You'll find a link to this episode in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app. And while you're clicking on links, don't forget the one to the special Cornell University Press sales page. They created that page just for you, and on it you'll find many great history books available at a 30% discount. And if you'd like the direct link for that, it's benfranklinsworld.com slash Cornell. Finally, how do you think historical sites and markers should incorporate the history of the nation's slave past? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.